Hi everybody, welcome. You saw what the label was on the tin and you are here to learn Blender version 2.8 and above for the purpose of 3D printing. Blender is ridiculously deep. It's got a zillion features and you've probably heard that it has a bit of a learning curve. But the good news for you is that as a 3D printer, you only need to know part of it. You don't really need to learn the whole software, so I'm going to try to show you just, you know, the bits that you actually need to know and the parts that you're going to use. I've been using this software for years and I'm far from an expert at it. So there's no way I can possibly make you an expert in a short amount of time. But at least I can show you where to click. Let's get to it. Blender. I'm in version 2.82. You should check on blender.org to get the latest and greatest version because it is, after all, the latest. Um, you know, and, and, and the greatest. Uh, here we are in the interface. Blender has got animation. It's got rendering. It's got lighting. It's got textures. It's got just so much power going on here. Uh, in my opinion, Blender is going to be really good for kind of an artistic type people. It doesn't really lend itself to CAD programs or mechanical type things. I'm sure somebody out there who's a Blender aficionado is going to yell at me and say, that's not true, you can add this, that, and the other thing. Well, fine, leave it in the comments and help somebody else in the future. Uh, but right out of the box, I think Blender really lends itself to an artistic kind of a thing. Let's take a look at the stuff that you need to pay attention to in Blender and also the stuff that you can kind of ignore. Uh, first of all, I am using my mouse with a middle scroll wheel. Da, 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 da. We can scroll in, we can scroll out. We can press down on that middle mouse button and orbit around. Now, if you don't have that kind of a mouse, don't worry. I've got a workaround. Just hold on a second. Um, if while you're holding down that middle mouse button and orbiting like this, if you hold down shift, you'll kind of drag and pan. Okay, so that's the first thing I want you to do. In case you didn't know, this is indeed a follow along kind of a lesson. So open up Blender in another window if you can. If you've got another monitor, that would be even better. And go ahead and orbit around like this with me and scroll in and scroll out. Look at that, you're using Blender, very exciting. So if you don't have a mouse like the kind that I just told you about with the middle click, this little gizmo up here is your friend. You can actually click and drag on this guy here and change your view. You can grab the hand tool, and you're not actually picking up a tool, so don't expect to grab a tool and use it. Hold down the button. Just hold down on that hand button and drag around, and that's how that works. Scroll out. I'm going to drag back in. Same thing with this little zoom in and zoom out guy right there, okay? We can also toggle views between orthographic and perspective. Perspective is like this natural kind of a thing. It looks like your eye, whereas orthographic is a flat kind of a view, and it looks a little bit weird at first. But what it does is it lines up all the edges so you can really align things very accurately. So very useful. So these guys over here are helpful if you don't have the ability to move around with a mouse, like I suggest that you would. Uh, the other thing that you can do is change from object mode to edit mode, and we're going to do that a lot. You can do it with this little drop down on the top left, but it's much quicker just to hit tab on the keyboard back and forth, okay? But it's up here. There's some other things in here that are also useful to change your view, so we can change our viewpoints from you know, the front, the back, the left, the right, all through here. If you notice, there's tool tips on the side here, number pad 7, number pad 1. If you've got a full number pad on your keyboard, it makes life a little bit faster because you can hit 1, to go to the front, three for the right, and you can see it up here, it's telling you what it is. Seven for the top, and I'll go back to the front, and you can hit five in the middle there to switch from orthographic to perspective. But as I just showed you, all those features are indeed hidden in a menu, or not really hidden, it's right there. <laughs> View, and you can change all that. Uh, lots of different tools up in here. The one that we want to look at probably right away is going to be add. I personally suspect that Blender is eventually going to add a whole toolbar like this nice little side toolbar here to have a, have a bunch of standard primitives. Mainly you want to look at the different meshes that you can add. Planes, cubes, circles, UV spheres, that kind of thing because that's the sort of objects that we're going to be working with as we model. Alright, so there we go. Along the side we've got some different tools that we will also use. A select box so you actually have this selection all the time. All you have to do is drag a box around stuff and you're doing it. You should probably just leave it at that one. It's the easiest way to go. Another thing you're going to want to do is to grab and move things. There are buttons for that, but the easiest thing to do is just to hit G on the keyboard and now you're moving something. That's called a grab. And Control z works just like it would on undoing anything. So I can click off the box, on the box. I can drag a box around the box. <laughs> um, the other thing we could do is rotate and we can scale 
and we can do different transforms. Usually what I do when I'm working in Blender is to just leave it alone, don't do that, and do a couple of basic moves on a keyboard. Like I said, you're gonna mainly wanna select things, G to grab them, S to scale them, R to rotate them. Those are a couple of keyboard shortcuts. Usually when you're working with Blender, there's just a few things. Keep your hand on that left side of your keyboard so you can hit tab to edit all the time and just to grab, rotate, and scale and to do a few things like that and it's gonna make life a lot easier. The tools are all here, but it's just a lot easier for you to know just a couple of quick, very simple, very easy to remember shortcuts and that's the way to move quicker through Blender. Another thing I would like to do right now before we go too far is to just go ahead and let's just delete the camera and the light because we're not rendering. So I'm gonna click the camera and hit delete on my keyboard. Boom, it's gone. I'm gonna hit the light there and hit delete and it's gone. We don't need to render stuff. We don't need to light it. We're doing 3D printing. Alongside the bottom here is animation. This is a timeline and you don't need it. You're not animating anything, so ignore that too. Uh, jump up to the top right. This is helpful. This is a view that kind of shows you a hierarchy view of everything that you've got. And right now you've got a cube. Yay, one cube. Um, if you don't have too many objects in the scene, it's, it's nice to have it. It's nice to know that it's there. You can select things. You can hide them that way. And you can see what you're doing and keep yourself organized up there. You can add new collections to group things together and to hide them or use them all at once. But uh, if you're doing something simple, just you don't have to worry about that either. You can just leave it be. Uh, but it is there. This side panel here has got a lot of great stuff, but you only need a couple of them. Again, there's so much power in the software, but you don't need much of it. Like, for example, we've got rendering, and we've got outputs, and layers and scenes, and we've got animations, and we've got particle systems and textures. Uh, you can ignore most of it. Yay! Ignore most of it. Uh, let's look at the... We, we are going to want to use this little modifier here. This is a context menu, and it is a little wrench there. And there are a zillion cool modifiers in here that uh, I can't even get into them all. You can have a lot of fun playing with tons of these. The one that we will probably try to use later on is the Boolean. Uh, that one's really, really, really neat. It allows you to add and subtract objects together to build more complicated things, and we really like that. Uh, so the Booleans are really neat. There's just there's too much to even possibly uh explain it all in a quick video like this one. Uh, you could use particles probably to create something more complicated and intricate, uh, but uh, I wouldn't worry about that right now. Uh, this one right here, the thing that you're really going to want to use it for, this is your um, object properties. You could rename something right here if you want to. Mm, there, there's a lot of properties in there, but you really don't need to worry about it too much right now. Uh, most of the rest of this stuff is about, it's about textures and materials. It's about uh, different groupings and things of that nature, so you don't need most of it. The one that I would like you to pay the most attention to is the wrench there. If you choose to go into using curves and text and things like that, you can model that way. Right now we're modeling to a direct mesh kind of a mode where we're having direct control of our vertexes, and I'm going to hit the tab to go in and select these vertexes, as you can see, boop, 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 and tab to go back to the entire box. So if we wanted to work in a mesh kind of a way, if you're familiar with curves, Blender can support that kind of a thing. We can make a little bit more of a resolution independent type thing. So adding in a logo, we could do that. We could import that kind of thing. It's a little bit outside of the scope of this video, but just so that you know. So if you want to add that kind of thing, it is available down here. I'll show you real, real, real fast. We're going to hit add text. We'll hit add up here at the menu, or you can use a shortcut shift A and add text. And I'm going to hit tab to edit it, and we're editing text. Hi! And I'll orbit around, and you can see there it is. I'll hit G to grab it, and there's that text. And as you can see, this panel shifted to a little A because now it's text. So it's going to allow you to do some more like extruding that text out uh, and making a block out of text. Or you could do the same thing if we were adding a curvature like a, a disk or anything else. But anyway that's there. So that's actually most of the stuff you need to know in here. The other thing I'd like to point out to you is when we are in edit mode, when we hit tab and go into edit mode, we get this whole panel out here which is really nifty. These are a ton of different things that you can do while editing. They're all your tools for editing. So if you want to extrude and bevel and make things like that, you know, all these different kind of things are pretty self-explanatory, but uh, just be aware that they are there, and we'll fiddle with a couple of them here real quick. I'm going to show you while we're in the edit mode how to go ahead and start editing on this cube. It's pretty dull to have a cube. I'm going to go and hit 
the face mode up here. Up here on the top left, this is not 100% obvious, but that, again, I'm just showing you the stuff you need to know, so it might be a little bit hidden if you weren't aware of it. There are three different ways to edit this guy. We're right now in a vertex editing mode. We can also select by edges. And you can see, I'm going to zoom in, you can see we're clicking edges now, or we can select by faces. And that allows us to, you guessed it, select the entire face. That can be pretty helpful. So I do want to point that out. There are three different ways to edit any mesh object. Just don't make a mesh of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right now what I'm going to do is, why don't we go ahead and do an extrude on this guy. And it's got this neat, neat little widget that comes out. We'll just extrude it out that way. And we'll click on another one and we still have the extrude tool. And we can just keep doing this. Dun, da, da, dun, da. Isn't that nifty? So you can see how we might build up something out of a bunch of different pieces and to make whatever you want to make out of it. We could go to an edge select. I'll grab that front edge and I'll just go back to my select and we will hit this move button as I told you it's a lot easier just to hit G to grab it and we can grab it by this little Z right there and just drag it straight down so there you go that's your basic moving around I'm gonna show you another trick now that's gonna be ridiculously helpful and this applies to editing to moving to object mode to literally anything you're doing scaling rotating anytime you start doing any kind of a movement like that and in this case I'll just hit G to grab it okay if you hit X, Y, or Z, it will lock it down to that direction. X, Y, or Z. Grab, it's moving free, but now I'm going to hit X. Now it's only moving along X. Same thing would happen if I were scaling or extruding that. Now you might as well know right now that Z is up with Blender. Or for those of you across the pond, that would be direction Z is up. Or grab it and hit Z to go up in the Z direction. Uh, so we can do that in any direction, but X and Y are the ground plane, and Z is the up and down axis. That's just the way Blender works. So let's go ahead and I will just do a new workspace and I'm going to show you how to export stuff out of Blender and we're going to go over into Cura and be aware that Cura is going to be really bright so don't let me blind you when we do that. We'll just hit File, Export, STL. That's what we need for 3D printing, STL. So here's our export menu and we'll see in my 3D files. I'm just going to call this test. It's lit up red because it's going to overwrite that. That's the only warning Blender is going to give you that it's about to overwrite something. It does not hold your hand, believe you me. The red says I'm going to override it. There is not going to be another warning. Boom. I just overwrote test cube. I know. It's just the worst thing ever. Let me jump over to Cure real quick. And for those of you who care, I am recording in open broadcast software, OBS. Uh, let's go ahead and open from the same thing. I'll go to 3D files where I've saved my stuff. And import test. <gasps> Look. It's a cube. It's a tiny, tiny cube. I know what you're thinking. Why is it so small? Insert your own joke and let's go back over to Blender and find out why it's so small. We're going to get into a little bit of setup now because this is really helpful. Again, let's delete the camera and delete that little light there and find out why this thing was so tiny over in Cura. There's a little flyout menu up here that's kind of hidden, but we're going to hit the N key, the number key. It's right here, that little arrow dilly bobber that was sitting on the side tucked away is really helpful and I would like you to have that open while you're using Blender because well it's helpful uh, right here in the dimensions it says two meters by two meters by two meters now when we imported that to Cura it didn't import a two meters do you know why well because Cura doesn't know what Blender thinks of as measurements and units you can set Blender's measurement to be two miles and Cura won't care because it's just two it doesn't care about the meters it's two to what? To whatever Cura is doing. And in Cura's case, it's millimeters. So two millimeters. Doesn't matter. You People used to just talk of this as Blender units, but now it just put an M on there. So <laughs> it used to just be Blender units. So this is an upgrade. But again, it's just a matter of Cura doesn't honor what Blender thinks. Okay. So let's do, I don't know, 50 by 50 by 50. We can scale it numerically there instead of using the S key. I could hit S to scale it, and we can see what's happening over there at the same time which is really helpful. And let's try this again. We're going to do a file, export STL, and we're going to export as test, overwrite the test. That's the only warning we're going to get. And let's clear the build plate. And I will open up the test cube again. You'll see that it's much bigger now. Boom, there it is. So just be aware when you're exporting from Blender to Cura, 
Whatever the number is, imagine that that is millimeters. So that brings me to something that's really neat that I love to do on setup. We're going to add something called an empty. It's going to be add an empty, and it's going to be an empty cube. This is something else to pay attention to. Again, I'm only hitting the highlights. I know every time I say something, I'm saying, here's something to pay attention to. That's because I'm only showing you the stuff that you really need in this case. Down here at the bottom left, this little guy just popped up, and it says, add empty. This is not 100% obvious, so that's why I had to point it out. Anytime you add something, you've got a minute to make some changes to it. And you can scale stuff later on, but for example, if you were to add a, a spear, you can't change the number of rings and loops that it's got, uh, except for right now when you do it. So let's do it here. The radius of it, this isn't a circle, but it's still using the concept of radius. It's measuring from the center out. I'm using an MP Mini for this exercise, and the build plate of an MP Mini is 120 millimeters all around, so the radius would be half that, right? Half that. So I added this empty. It is not a printing object. It will never get exported, but it is really cool. I like to do this all the time when I set up a 3D project, is to be set up exactly like what you see here. No camera, no light, yes on the little fly out menu, and set up an empty that represents the space of my build area. This is just a, help, a helpful thing for me to know you know what something really looks like because a lot of times I'll be working on something I'll just eyeball it and say that looks kind of small on there or it's it's too big for the print area so having this sort of a setup for your printer is really really good and you can use the scaling over here on the side to change that well, let's take a look it's a little bit harder with an empty it just operates differently uh, but with an object you can definitely change the dimensions and you can match up your cube to fit that so what we're looking at now is something of a default setup you can actually make something like this your default setup in Blender all the time with a, a keyboard shortcut uh, control U uh, but I wouldn't necessarily suggest doing that if you do control U this will be your default setup all the time um, but if if you like it and you want to do that and you're only going to use Blender for 3D printing then you know go for it go ahead and do that uh, let's go ahead and show how to import something and I'm gonna delete that cube real quick file import STL same thing we did on the exporting. So here's an STL that we can pull in. This is a little guy that I was messing with. <laughs> you recognize him? I'll grab my default cube. I will G to grab it, but I'll hold it to the Z axis and go up with it. I'm going to show you a little thing while I'm doing that, by the way. I'll go to 1 to the front view. I'm going to grab it again along the Z axis. I'll show you a neat thing. Anytime you're moving numbers around, even if you're using it numerically, even if you're doing it numerically and you're changing things, you can do this. You can slide across that that uh, scale right there, the XY. I'm just dragging along it. While you're doing that, you can hold down the Shift button and it will do it really, really, really gently. That same thing applies when we grab this along the Z axis. I hit G and then Z. And if I hold down the Shift button while I'm doing that, it goes really slowly. By the way, did you see Blender's magic trick right there? I'm dragging through, and the cursor wraps around to the other side. Isn't that fun? I'm sorry that amuses me. <laughs> the opposite of doing that kind of a thing, holding down Shift when removing anything, I'm going to grab it along the X axis, and I'm going to hold down Control, and we'll find out that it does more of a snappy kind of a motion. When you're moving individual vertices, you can really see that in action when you're up close, so I'll grab it along the X axis, holding down Control, and you can see it's actually snapping to those grids there. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, go ahead and play with that, and you'll feel how it snaps into place. You can feel it a little bit better than you can actually see it. So a guy like this little dude here would have been built up from a cube, just doing some extruding and extruding, just like I showed you, and some other neat tricks like splitting and mirroring. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at doing some basic modeling here. We'll make a little something. We're not going to make a full-out Groot here, but I'm going to show you how to do some basic modeling, okay? Get on the catwalk and strut your stuff doing modeling. Okay, maybe it's a different kind of modeling. <laughs> if I hit tab, you can see he's fairly dense mesh. All right, go to the front view. All right, goodbye, baby Groot. Boop, he's out of there. Let's start out like we always start out, which is to add a default cube. We can hit add, and we're going to add a mesh type object, and I will add a cube. And again, this guy down here, this little add cube, is a temporary opportunity to make some serious changes to it. With a cube, there's not much to do here. So let me add something else just to show you what I was talking about there. Add a mesh type object, a UV sphere. 
I would like it. You see here, this is where it gets important. These segments and rings will be harder to change. The radius you can always change just by scaling the darn thing. Let's make it, uh, I don't know, 40. Nice big, nice big, nice big sphere in there. Happy little sphere. But we can change the radiuses, the segments and the rings of it. You can change the radius easily by scaling, but adding more control points like this would be a little bit harder later on. So right now is the best time for you to make those kind of a changes. We can do, I, I don't know why, I like to do like 64 and 64 and 128. I do it by eights. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it must be some computer programming thing that's locked in my head to do it in that way. But anytime you're adding a new object, we'll add another one just because I want to. Anytime you're adding a new object, you'll see that little fly out down here. If it's collapsed, go ahead and open it up and make some important changes right now because some of these will be a little bit harder, like these segments in the in the torus. You see right there, I just scaled it, so now it's a little bit locked down into resizing. If I wanted to make those changes to begin with, let me select that guy, delete him. We will add a mesh object again just to show you. I'm going to show you a trick on the little number pad, by the way, the decimal point. Decimal point on your flyout number pad will, will uh, focus up on that. Right now we'll add 64 segments, and we'll do 128 segments, and there you go, a nice complicated donut. And we can make a lot of different changes. It's easy to scale it up later on, but it's hard to make some changes of that kind of thing, like changing the actual segments that are in it. You follow me? All right. I'm going to hit Shift A from now on just because it's easier. I'm going to add in a cube. I'm going to scale it up. Go to the front view. Grab it along the Z axis. Go up. I'm going to hit Tab to edit this and show you another thing. Hit Z on your keyboard for a little flyout that lets you look at it in some different views like solid and wireframes are the ones that I like to do. Wireframe is this little transparent see-through kind of a thing. That's really neat because since we're doing this box select that we talked about earlier, it's easy for me to box select the entire side. I know what you're thinking, hey, couldn't you just go to that face select like I did earlier and just click it? Yes, yes I could, but I'm lazy. I'm going to hit grab along the X axis and slide it in here, and we're actually going to delete this guy with the delete key. It says, what do you want to delete? I want to delete the face and we'll keep the rest of it. Boop, boop, boop. This is Z to the solid view, and now you can see I've got kind of an empty box. We're going to go over here to this modifier that I told you to pay attention to because it is so awesome, and we're going to add in a modifier that's going to be a mirror modifier. This is going to save you so much trouble. So, so, so much trouble. <laughs> now, what did I just do? Why did I do what I did? Well, what I did was I slid everything over so that the center point is this little dot right there floating in space. I can't really zoom on in on it because it's just a helper visual thing. The center point is now at the center of my world. It's over to the very far right of the object itself. And when I do that mirror modifier, it's going to mirror from that center point. So if I don't want to have an object that has geometry overlapping itself, I want that center point to be out at the very edge of it. And I got rid of the interior face because I don't want to have an interior face inside of itself. It just wants to be hollow inside. You follow me? So I'm going to add in a mirror modifier. Boop. Now, if I'm in here in editing, I'll hit Z again and go back to that wireframe view. Now you can see I've got an object that should be hollow inside, and it is. But when I make edits, and I'll do click, and I'll do a shift click, new trick, shift click on the other vertex, shift click. When I G to grab that, you can see it's doing the same thing on the other side. Isn't that fun? Now right here I can tell just by looking at it that these vertexes, vertices, I always mess up my nomenclature, my vertices aren't quite clipping together. So we can do the merge limit down here. Remember how I told you you can drag on any kind of a bar like this instead of just typing in numbers? Well we can. We can drag on that and we can change the merge limit. Looks like it's a little bit outside of what we might like. So let's go ahead and grab that. I'll grab all of them by selecting A. Double click A to deselect all. A to select all. Double click A to deselect all. A to select all. Got it? I'll grab along the X and I'm going to hold down Shift. This is all the stuff I've been teaching you so far. Right along there. That's good. 
So now these guys ought to be able to merge. But if things aren't snapping quite the way you want them to, you can increase the merge limit there to help them all snap together. Boom, very nice. Solid object. Back to tab. To edit, click, click. Front view on the one. Grab it and move it around. I'll go to the side view. Click that vertex over there, that vertex over there with a shift click. I'll go back to the front view. Grab it. There. I'm going to go to face mode. I'll select this. Mostly I'm doing this kind of a work just to show you the tricks that we've been learning so far. And I'm going to use the extrude function over here. Extrude. Down. Now, did you notice those guys were snapping together? That's because our merge limit is probably a little high and it was trying to merge those guys together. So let's grab it and move it back up until it starts merging where we don't want it to. And we'll reduce the merge limit on this mirror. until it stops snapping where we don't want it to. We want the center line to snap together, but not all the other lines. It'll try to merge them together. Now, by the way, anything that we're doing right now in modifiers has not actually changed the geometry. So if we export this, Cura won't know what to do with it. The STL will just be half of it. We're going to have to actually apply this. But don't do that until you're finished with your modeling. I'm going to hit the Rotate button, which is over here, or just hit R to rotate. R to rotate. I'm going to hold down shift to do it gently and there we go. And now I'm going to hit S to scale it but I'm going to do S scale along X. Only along X. I'll rotate that while holding shift and I'm going to go to the side view with a 3 and we can see that we're a little bit chunky here so if we were making a character we'd want to make a few changes. AA to deselect everything I'll drag a box around the entire front of this, grab it, and move it along Y by hitting G to grab, and then Y to move that just along that axis. AA. I'll box select it, grab along Y, move it back in. AA. Make sure I have not selected stuff. Sometimes I'll accidentally select things and have vertexes on the other side of it that I didn't mean to. Uh, so a lot of times I'll just get into the habit of select all, T select all. Just a good habit to make sure I didn't select stuff I didn't mean to. But I hope that you can kind of get the idea of how this sort of thing works. Now, we don't really have enough geometry to make anything interesting right now, so it's a great opportunity for us to add some more geometry. I'll hit tab, make sure we're in this select mode, and we'll use another tool over here on the side. I already looked at the extrude button, but I would like to use this one, which is a loop cut, and you can see it's control R. If we click on it, we can choose one of these angles here, the side or the or the waistline kind of an area, and we'll click it, and it adds a little side cut there. And we could keep on doing some more to add more geometry. Uh, a good rule of thumb is don't add more geometry than you really need. Uh, the other thing that I want to show you, and I'll undo that, that change that I just did, is that control R actually gives you a smidge more control. If I hit control R, I can actually move the loop cut up and down while I'm doing it. I find that with the tool itself, it just bang, there it is. Uh, but with a control R shortcut, I have a little bit more control. So there we go. And I'll get off of that and I'll go back to my handy dandy selection tool. I'm going to shift click these two guys and I'll grab them along the X axis. And as you can see, we're starting to get a little bit of a character here. Control R again gets me into that loop cut tool and I can slide that up. I'm going to go into that wireframe view box like that, grab it, move it down. Controlling the flow of your loops is really important if you want to be any good at 3D modeling. That takes time to learn and I wouldn't say that I'm even all that awesome at it, but here we are. Now remember how I told you you can press X, Y, or Z at any point on any tool you're doing to get control over it? Here's a great time for you to look at that. If I'm going to box select this guy and extrude, it's going to try to go off that wonky angle. I actually want to extrude along X, so I'm going to press X. And now I'm extruding along X. Isn't that fun? To this day, I keep clicking B to box select because that's the way it used to be in Blender. You had to click B to box select, but now it's kind of the default behavior. But I still have a habit of hitting B. All I'm doing is box selecting, extruding, scaling, extruding, scaling. Oh no, it's crazy. It is all crazy. So we're going to go ahead and fix that now. We're going to go ahead to the top view. I'm going to hit this wireframe view again by hitting Z 
and going to the wireframe view, right? I'm going to box select this guy. I'm going to scale it along the Y axis. Deselect all with that double tap like I just did. Box select all that and scale along Y. There we go. I'm going to show you another trick just because that's what we're doing today. I'm going to box select this. I'm going to hit Control plus. Look at that. And that grows your selection up and down. So I think we've done a lot of the basic moving and extruding. So you can see how we can start to get our figure the way we want it to go. And this is true of anything that you're trying to make. I'm just making kind of a human character just because I felt like it. But you could, of course, be making anything, any helpful object or printable thing that you want to make. Now, since we're over here learning about these modifiers, I'm going to show you a couple of more modifiers because they're so darned helpful. So I'm going to go ahead and add another mesh, and I will just add in... Um, let's do a cylinder. We haven't done a cylinder yet. Uh, we'll do one with, let's say, 64 and a radius of 10 and a depth of 10. Where did it go? Well, it's down there. We'll grab it and move it along the z-axis. I'll scale it up along z and scale it down. This might be something useful if you're trying to make something that has different parts that are going to be assembled. Wow, my character is chunky, aren't they? <laughs> Let's go ahead and click this mesh. And uh, again, this would be the last thing you want to do, but I am going to be messing with the geometry a bit, so I might want to go ahead and apply this. But l let me just, just for giggles, let's see if we can add another. If you're working in the modifier panel, it goes in stack order so you can actually add more modifiers on top of modifiers so I can add a, uh, a modifier that's going to smooth the whole thing out which would be a subdivision modifier you see there pretty trippy huh uh, the booleans are one that I would really really love to show you here so we're gonna hit boolean modifier and in this case we'll do there's several different ones to intersect them to divide them from each other to merge them into one and what this is gonna do is take different shapes and use them to cut pieces from each other or smash them together into one total shape in this case I'm gonna do a boolean difference and the object that I want to do a difference of I can use the eyedropper tool is that cylinder and what that's going to do is cut out a hole out of it if we go over here, remember this top right panel I said to be aware that it's there? If I hide it, its effect will still be visible. I'm just hiding it from my view right now. Now, if I were to export right now, what I would wind up getting is a cylinder and a half of a little figure, and the cut will not be applied because those are all modifiers in Blender. We need to actually apply them to the mesh and clean up our mesh. Don't make a mesh of it. Sorry, I said I wasn't going to do that again. Uh, let's take that cylinder and we can move it down a little bit deeper into the model and we can tell that we're carving out a little hole on the top. So imagine you're making, I don't know, a doll out of this and you want to do a little bobblehead. That would be the way to do it. So I'm going to go to this object and let's go ahead and apply that boolean and I'm going to grab that cylinder and we can delete it. Now, look at that. It's a little bit weird. It didn't do what we thought it would. Well, it's probably because we've got too many modifiers applied on here. Let's go ahead and start collapsing some of these modifiers and actually building something out of it. I'll apply the mirror modifier. Let me hide that cylinder. There we go. And we will apply this Boolean difference. Let's grab that cylinder now and delete it. There we go. So like I said, these are just modifying. They're not actually making structural changes to anything. So sometimes you will need to go ahead and apply those modifiers to make sure you're actually editing the mesh. Uh, unfortunately, we've now lost the ability to have that mirror mode. All right, so before we go too much further towards exporting, just take a look at your mesh and make sure it doesn't have any doubled up vertices anywhere. Make sure it's airtight. We don't have any open hanging faces. We want to do some various cleanup here. So what we can do is select all of it, and we can do Mesh and we'll hit normals and hit recalculate outside the reason we're doing this is because every 3d face has an inside and an outside and we want to make sure that it hasn't flipped anything inside out so that's always just a helpful thing to do uh, the other thing we can do is hit mesh clean up and we're going to merge by distance we want to make sure that we don't have vertices on top of each other is what we're doing and we can actually do like everything else remember when we were building objects this little fly out menu comes down here what we can do is to move this slider and it's actually going to remove some geometry if we take it too far but just having it zero is going to make sure that it just is doing 
you know, just the meshes on top of itself. Uh, I'm sorry, just the vertex is on top of itself. So we want to make sure we don't have a vertex on top of a vertex. And that's all we're doing there. Cool. Uh, so that ought to be good. So let's do a file and we'll do an export as an STL file again, like we did earlier today. And I will overwrite the test. Test cube is screaming out in agony, going, Why did you destroy me? Uh, we will clear the build plate. That'll be the way to go. And we will import the test object again, which in this case will be our weird fiddly diddly thing there. Uh, and as you can see, it fills the cube of my build plate exactly as it did on our test space in our empty space over here this empty cube that I had and it should look very much alike now you're gonna feel really funny by the way going back and forth between software after you've been in blender for a while holding in that middle mouse button when you come to cura you need to press down the right mouse button to do that of course I always it takes me a few minutes to get back into the mode of any program because I get so into blender uh, but as you can see, it looks exactly like it did over there in Blender, and we're getting the exact model that we expected to get. So back over in Blender here, you can see that it looks exactly like it does on our export. Um, anything that you've got in your scene right now, even if it's hidden, is going to export. So let's add a... You know, I told you we were talking about curves earlier. Why don't we go ahead and take a quick look at curves. I'll add a circle type curve, and this one is a lot more editable later on but let's go ahead and change the radius and you can see there's a circle down there on the ground and we'll go to that curves panel over here and we are going to do some geometry and we're going to extrude it right now it's a flat hoop but we want to go ahead and fill both sides of it uh, I'm going to change it to a 2d hoop and make sure that it's filling both sides of it there we go so we've got a nice little hoop um, the neat thing about any curves, if we hit tab to edit the thing, it's just four control points on it, and it is resolution independent, which means we can actually increase the resolution of it as it goes along, which is pretty darn cool. Um, that's because the resolution preview up here is at 12 points. We can increase this, and the render uh, is just going to do the same thing as the, as the uh, preview if we leave it alone. The reason that's important is because when you export over into Cura, if you have a low number of facets there, like 32, you'll see it. It will be very noticeable that you've got a very chunky looking kind of a, a disk. And we'll grab that along the Z axis, pull it up. I'll go to the front view, grab it down. This is what I do when I'm making little tabletop gaming figurines, actually. I'll scale that down and we'll scale it up along the Z axis. Pretty neat, pretty neat. So now we've just used two different types of modeling together at the same time. And I don't have to merge these together, okay? This is still a separate object. I didn't do a Boolean on that. By the way, you can't do a Boolean on a, on a curve object. You'd have to convert it to a, uh, to a mesh object. Uh, let's go ahead and file, export. We'll export an STL again. Export, overwrite, go back to Cura. And I believe we should be able to reload that. Yeah, there we go. And there we go. As you can see, it just loaded in that change. Even though it's a curve object, and even though it's a separate object, it's still loaded in. So that's pretty cool. Um, just be aware that anything that you've got over in Blender, even if it's hidden, like we did earlier, is still going to export as an STL. So just uh, look to make sure you've got all the objects that you mean to have. So there you go. That's about all I have right now. Uh, for Blender, for 3D printing, there is about 4 billion more things that we could talk about that we could learn here. Uh, but I think that's about all the time we have right now. This tutorial has gone on a little bit longer than I meant to in the first place. Uh, but there's so much, and I love this program so much, I just want to share it uh, with you guys. If you've got any other great tips or great links, go ahead and share them. Uh, and if you enjoyed this, you know, thumbs up the whole thing. I appreciate it. I'm not trying to monetize. I just like to know that you care. <laughs> you guys have a great day. Be awesome.